There comes a point to anyone who is living when the effect of having noticed and named and exposed his or her suffered temptations has a releasing effect. I say named in the same manner that an exorcist will always want to name the demons, to have power over them. If you know someone or something's name, please here do not think of name as a mere word, but as a describer of that someone or something's nature, like an adjective, then you see them or it for what they are, for good or evil, for truth or falsehood. That knowing, that exposure, gives the power of choice. And the one who chooses, the one who sees and acts upon what he sees, internally, is the ego. If the exposed is evil and false, it will recoil, it will feel threatened, because falsehood always relies on subterfuge. It is threatened because, being false, they cannot subsist in the presence of even a single speck of truth in the ego. If, however, the revealed is good and aligned with truth, then it carries no fear of its own revelation and it welcomes exposure to the ego warmly. Evil influences will always try to denounce a living revelation exactly because they cannot exist where life is. Now, the evil and the false will usually use words or symbols and require explanation and systems to be believed in because those are replacements for what is truth that can never be represented beyond its own timeless self. The true and good, in contrast, will manifest itself to the ego as an undeniable and evident knowing that requires nothing else but that same manifestation. The ego is, I reiterate, as was stated in previous contemplations and channel comments, the key element in mankind, the one left alone, seemingly abandoned in the fog, left to discern back his living origin amidst the mud of decay and death. That is why, I also repeat, the ego has been the main target and victim of all the systems, both of the materialistic or nihilistic world and of the demon's worship. A weakened, confused and traumatized ego is, therefore, far more susceptible to temptation be it presented in a sweet, pleasing form or enveloped in grotesque and iniquitous, triggered emotions. So, it is the responsibility of the ego, of each of us, to prepare ourselves as we uncover more and more the veils of fog from the world, both in what is mirrored around us at first and then, inevitably and consequently, in our individual projection within. The nature of temptation shows its reliance on the ego's choice at all times. A grosser temptation that we could use as an allegoric example would be a voice carried by a thought, saying the words, Kill your father. Now these words would, by even a merely adequately sane ego, be refused outright and cast away as an evil thought. However, demonic or shadow temptation does not rely solely on tempting the ego directly for its end goal. They will try to circumvent that moral defense by convincing the ego to accept slow and gradual intermediate steps. In this example, the temptation would return later and say, Your father enjoys sweet flavors so much. Put more sugar in his coffee. He deserves the pleasure. He loves you so much and you show him your love by doing so. This would not immediately be identified by the ego as an evil whisper and he would be more prone to accept it and accede. After a while of serving his father's coffee with far more sugar to, like the voice said, show him your love, the father begins showing signs of illness. Now, given that the act of serving the coffee with too much sugar is now inculcated in the ego's perception as an act of love, 
it will never be seen as the cause for the illness. So the tempting thoughts will return again, and this time they will say, Your father is feeling ill. Take him to that good doctor you know, and show your love to him by helping take care of his malady. The ego considers this another reasonable and loving act. So, the doctor diagnoses diabetes and prescribes pharmaceutical drugs for it. The tempting demons return then, whispering, You love him so much. Make sure he takes the medicine as prescribed. Enforce it if necessary, because you love him and you want him to be well. And so the ego does acting apparently in the name of his love for his father, ensuring that his father takes all the pills as indicated by the doctor. Although symptoms ease up, the illness actually only gets worse over time. The ego insists on the medicine treatment because it brings his father some momentary relief and because it is his belief that it is an act of caring and love for him. Yet there is no actual improvement on his father's health. Not only diabetes afflict him now, but a, a myriad of other diagnosed conditions that require, likewise, more medicine. All is followed strictly by the ego, who thoroughly believes he is loving and caring, even if needing to lie to himself regarding the father's overall state of health. The association, the link between his actions that have been obedient to the whispered temptations and the results on his father's health are never contemplated, or, if they are, they are attacked by feelings of guilt, saying, You love your father, and you do what you can for him. Would you rather abandon him to his sickness? Eventually, his father's condition becomes so deteriorated that there seems to be no relief anymore. The pills do nothing. The other treatments prescribed cause only discomfort and show no actual improvement of any sort. The father is in great suffering and the doctor, acting as a vehicle for the shadow's temptation, tells the ego, There is nothing more we can do for him. He is not responding to treatment anymore. He is in great pain. He is being kept alive by a machine only, and it might be time to switch it off to give him peace. In the ego's mind, the tempting voice confirms accordingly. You love your father, and the last thing you want is for him to suffer. Switch off the machine and let him go with dignity. And so, in this gradual manner, the initial temptation, which was a gross and unrefined kill your father, is accepted by the ego in the name of a love that is so false as the voice that convinces him of it. Yes, this is one of the reasons why it is repeated in these contemplations that truth speaks no words. The worst is yet to come for that ego, because a sort of shame and guilt build up behind the scenes of his consciousness, generating a shadow that will follow the ego until he admits having accepted the temptation to do evil, even if disguised in the name of love. And until he is truly sorry, fully aware now of his self-deceit and of having been the instrument of evil. Now, the shadows would now change their plans. Having succeeded in taking this ego to commit evil, they will act upon his emerging guilt in several ways. One of them may be that there is uh, convincing him that there is no forgiveness or redemption for what he has done. Ironical that the same voice, so to speak, that tempted him to commit the act in the first place, now tempts him to convince himself that he is beyond redemption. Another way might be to push the ego deeper into the same evil and convince him to be a proponent and a promoter of euthanasia in the name of love, as a way to mask out that shame and pride 
for his own actions. Regardless of the strategy used by his tempting intelligence, the ego can only break free if he accepts that acceding to the temptation of those thoughts was on his own responsibility, and if he then awakens to his own inner currents, truly repented of what he had done. This brings him an immediate connection to life. This life will not only keep those thoughts and temptations away, but when they manage to approach in a moment of weakness, for evil is continuously waiting and looking for weaknesses, the ego will have now the tool of discernment and will be able to choose wisely and refuse evil, even if gradual like before. If, however, the ego continues to accept the temptations and to turn his back on the warning signs, there will come a time when the ego itself is no more and in its place stands a shadow, possessing its controls. How many around us have reached such a stage? Are even they beyond redemption? It may seem so to us, but the miraculous effect of contact with life can, instantaneously, and when we least expect, save even Darth Vader in the end, using the Star Wars trilogy to convey the idea. This allegory is presented as a mere example that I invite each of you to expand upon and realize. As has been implied previously in other contemplations, this is an individual journey that we all take together as we are put through the alembic or the stories in the Book of Reality. It is through the ego's moral discernment, I repeat, moral discernment, not merely mental or emotion or even seemingly spiritual, that the simplicity of life reveals itself and releases the ego from the previous characters he convinced himself to be. The saving power is always there, timelessly, merely waiting to extend its grace to the ego that accepts his own folly and turns his back on the shadows and demons. And note, every time you turn your back on demons, you turn your face towards life. And the same is true, vice versa. Punishment is the effect of being within shadow grasp, for in life all punishment ceases, because there the realization that it was all ultimately self-punishment for having listened to and accepted the temptations himself, as the shadows can only convince the ego to act as they wish, but cannot act for the ego themselves at least not before the stage of acceptance of their influence that leads to actual possession. Ego is then, again, I repeat because it's so important, not the enemy, but the key guardian of the choice, the guardian of morality, the one whose responsibility it is to choose. The ego has been attacked, called demonic, and blamed for all evil. Even the term egotism, which describes a selfishness that disregards any moral concerns and any wish to be in touch with life, is named after the ego to denigrate it. Exactly to make it weakened and easier to usurp. The ego is as much the doorway to temptation as it is the link with life. The ego is the essential custodian of our souls, and he should be morally nurtured and strengthened. Only someone with a healthy ego is able to think mentally with clarity, to feel emotionally with discernment, and to realize intuitively with life. The shadows need a traumatized, weakened ego. Quoting Robert Frost, don't ever take a fence down until you know why it was put up. <laughs>